Hello, friends. I'm Sarah Vanderwerf. Uh, and if you want to find me, uh, I write about mathematics and mathematics teaching. You can find me. Um, you can see my information there and you can follow me on social media, particularly Twitter, uh, where I talk about math education all the time. And I'm wondering if you remember worksheets that look like this um, from your classrooms. Um, I was recently observing in a classroom with a math teacher friend of mine, and I learned something that really resonated with me that I wanted to write about. And so I've written about this on my blog. Um, and you're watching me talk about uh, this here. Uh, this is a really common worksheet that's used uh, with students um, for multiplying binomials, but I want to use it today to talk about uh, the question we as math teachers, the one question that we should all be asking more than any other in our classrooms. So I'm as you're thinking about that worksheet, uh, be thinking like, what would that one question be? What would be the question I should be asking uh, my students about uh, their work? And so um, I was recently, like I said, in a classroom with my friend, Brooke Williams. Um, she's a Minnesota math leader. Um, and we were observing at a high school alternative school. Um, and in the classroom, students were working on a variety of things, depending um, where they arrived to that school and uh, mathematically what course they were in. And the teacher had students working on all kinds of things. And while the teacher was working with some other students, um, my friend Brooke and I uh, noticed a student on one side of the room working on this sheet. And um, he was uh, catching our eye and smiling at us. So we went up to him, uh, this high school student, and we said, um, like, how's it going? And Brooke was kind of leading that discussion. Um, and I was standing with her and she was like, how is it going? Um, and the student uh, was working on problem four. Uh, and this is what the student's work looked like. Um, and the student said, uh, well, um, I, 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 you know, like, I think that I, I got this right. Like, I think it's going OK. Um, and as I, as a former middle school and high school teacher was looking at this in my head, I was like, oh, I wonder if he's struggling, like, you know, the variable there is before the number. I'm wondering if he's struggling with that. Or I thought, oh my gosh, he's trying to use the distributed property. Maybe he's foiling. I don't know for sure. Um, maybe he doesn't know that he should combine like terms because there wasn't an answer written down yet. This was all that was there. Um, and I was like in my mind thinking all these things. As I'm thinking these things, Brooke Williams, who is just this amazing math leader, says to this student, because remember what that student had said? He said, you know, I think I think I'm doing this right. I think I'm doing OK. I'm not sure. And she said to him almost immediately, tell me, why did you say I think? And that student said to us, well, I'm not sure if 14 should be positive or negative. And what he said had nothing to do with what was going through my head. And in my former years as a teacher, I could have seen myself rushing to treat what I thought was wrong based on all my other experiences with students, that combining the like terms was gonna be a problem or how he was writing his variable and coefficient was going to be an issue. What I never thought about in that split second before Brooke asked that question was he might be struggling because I looked at that 14 and had the correct sign that that was things. After Brooke asked that question, she went on to really briefly work with him around whether that was correct or not. And uh, as we walked away, um, he uh, answered the question. I'll show you that in a moment. And it reminded me of this really amazing video. If you've never seen it, it's just a five minute video from Max Ray. It was an Ignite from several years ago. It's one of my favorite. It's titled, Why is two greater than four? A proof by induction. Um, and in this video, I like to call it the two is greater than four video. Um, Max makes an argument about listening to students. Um, it's hard for us teachers to listen, but even more important than listening, he asked us and challenged us to think about, are we listening to students and what they have to say to us, or are we listening for the answers that we want? Whoo! With this student, this high school student, my mind and my mind is well practiced at immediately thinking about when students ask us questions. I'm not really listening to what they have to say. I'm already formulating answers for what I think that they think. And I'm listening for the answer and thinking about the race to the answer because that's what I've been conditioned to believe a math classroom is. And Max in this video, go watch it, it's brilliant. 
uh, tell stories from his history um, that really challenge us as teachers to start listening to what our students are saying. And I believe there's a question that Brooke asked that led to her listening to the student and then diagnosing it. When we looked at his paper a few minutes later, actually it was seconds later, without our help, we never once told him to combine like terms or any of that stuff. He had written down this as a solution to his problem. So what well, the lesson I learned um, is written here is don't assume what students will say. We need to be asking questions to get into their head because a lot of times we rush in and treat the wrong things or the way that we ask, you know, explain what you're doing doesn't get at those things. And what Brooke had said, and I think is the most important question we can ask that I can ask is to our students, why did you say, and then fill in the blank. In this case, Brooke said, why did you say, I think, and then she let the student talk. To me, this is the best formative assessment you can do. You can do all the exit tickets in the world. Those are great. But this right here in our classroom, if we as teachers get this right and ask forms of this question multiple times an hour, and when if every student that we're working with individually and in our classrooms, when students respond, we don't just take their answer. We always ask them, uh, a follow-up question that gets them to uh, bring their mathematical reasoning to that. To me, that is the formative assessment that will allow us in the classroom to make, because the data that we collect isn't formative assessment unless we do something with that data. And what Brooke did in this case wasn't to talk about combining like terms, but was to make sure the student felt comfortable with how to multiply integers and if an a, a, a integer is negative what that could mean for its solution and so she treated very quickly and with the confidence of the student not the wrong thing but the right thing um here's another example uh this is a visual pattern that i use at the beginning of the year um, no matter what grade level i'm teaching uh, with my students uh, and the way that i use this with my students um the question that they're ultimately going to answer um, but it's not what I show them first is how many white squares would be in the fourth patio, the 43rd patio or in the nth patio. And we're going to generalize um, the formula. But I just start with the third picture there and I ask them some questions about this. Um, but I don't want to assume what they're going to say because I'm wondering how many white squares are there. So I'm going to talk to you about how this plays out in my classroom. But um, when I was uh, playing around with this, I played around with this uh, particular pattern with my nephews. I don't have any children. These are my three nephews. That's my dad. Uh, they are always engaged. Uh, they love playing games. They love doing puzzles. They are like all students, all children, natural mathematicians from birth. Um, when I did this with my nephews, they were, uh, and they currently are four, six, and seven. Um, the four-year-olds in preschool, the six-year-olds in kindergarten, and the oldest is in second grade. And so one at a time, and I have this videotaped um, with my nephews, um, I had them and I didn't uh, use a picture uh, that I use with my students. I actually built this with squares. And I said to my nephews one at a time, um, I said to uh, the youngest, the four-year-old, I said to the four-year-old, hey, how many blue squares are there? And he thought and he thought and he said eight. Now, developmentally, um, you know, I said, well, how do you know there's eight? And uh, if you know anything about developmental and students, he's still in a one-to-one -one thing. And he put his cute little chubby fingers on each of these things. And he counted out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He actually started with the one that has a one on it and put a nine. Luckily, I didn't assume he was done thinking and I didn't jump in and try and correct him. I just waited um, and I waited and he actually uh, backed up and he actually started over and he pulled each blue square out and he said there are eight and he corrected his own uh, correction. And so I had some formative assessment that he's developmentally right where he should be in a one-to-one -one, um, correspondence with number and object. Um, and so it was great. And I asked him how he thought about it. The six-year-old, um, when I showed him the same safe um, thing, he thought for just a few seconds and he yelled out excitedly eight. And I said to the six-year-old, uh, how do you see the number eight? 
And he took the top three tiles and pushed them away. And he said, well, I saw three here and I saw three here and three and three is six. And then he counted seven and eight. There's two more there. And he got eight this way. Well, he's in kindergarten and really developmentally, he's a little bit above where he should be. He should still be kind of in this one-to-one -one correspondence with number and object. Um, and this was at the beginning of his kindergarten year. Um, but he had seen that differently. And I wouldn't have known that if I had not asked him, how did you see uh, the number eight? Uh, I also asked the seven-year-old, how did you see it? And I was expecting him to see it similar to the four-year-old or excuse me, the six-year-old who's in kindergarten. The seven-year-old is in second grade. And he says to me, uh, on Sarah, there are eight blue squares. And I said, uh, how do you know there's eight? And he said, well, I know that the whole thing is nine. And if you take the one away in the middle, that that is eight. And I'm thinking in my head, oh my gosh, this second grader, this seven-year-old, he's above grade level. Man, he must be knowing how to multiply. He must be seeing three groups of three. They're not supposed to start thinking about multiplication until third grade. But I didn't say anything like that to him. Instead, I asked that super important question. Well, how did you know it was nine? What did you mean by nine? And he said to me, well, I've just built that so much that I know it is nine. And so he's grown up playing with Legos and all kinds of other things where he had some permanence around that shape being nine. If I had built a five by five square, it would have been struggle. In fact, I followed up with a seven-year-old, this shape right here. He did not say I took three times five and got 15 and I built 15. And then I took the three away in a similar pattern. Nope. He went and did what the six-year-old done, which he said, I know there's 12 because there's five and five and five and five is 10. And then there's two more, so that makes 12. And he quickly came at the number 12 and get gotten in a lot of ways. But I would not have known this if I didn't use my favorite question of, tell me more, how do you see that number 12? How do you see the number eight in the earlier pictures? So some of the questions I think we should be using with our students is saying to them when they give us an answer, what do you mean by blank? Or maybe another way we'll freeze it, uh, phrase it is tell me more about blank. Um, I think these are two different are two questions, but really I think they're the same question. And I think these are the questions that we should be asking all the time because I don't think we should be assuming what students will say. So remember this task that I give students, the way that I start with it with my students is it looks like this. And I start with a math talk and I put up one image and I ask my students, how many white box do you see in the image and give them the time to think about it. And then when they give me a number, I ask them and then I annotate what they say. How did you see that number? Um, to me, that's the most important question I should be asking every day after every question that I ask to get more information about my students. I've had to train myself to ask these questions and not assume what students will say and not be listening for the answers that I'm uh, listening for like so much of our teaching I feel like maybe it's because we're in a race is this race to listen for the answers and then move on and we don't know if every student in the room understands it and that's why the same five or six students tend to get called on all the time because they've given the answer this teacher was listening for when I started training myself to ask um, some form of the questions that you see up here and I really believe all four of those questions are the same questions. That's when my classroom started to change. And I started to honor student reasoning over answer getting. And I started to see my students' math identity turn to a positive one that they had something they could contribute to class. And I started seeing growth in all students, not just some. And so my challenge to you and to Sarah Vanderwerf is am I listening for answers? And I'm using the words of Max Ray, go watch his video, because he said it better than I could, or am I listening to students and their reasoning? And then when I am listening to students, how am I using that information to inform my practice? So answers are, uh, I'm trying to decenter the idea of answer getting in my classroom and really elevate listening uh, to students. So that's the one question I think every math teacher should ask more than any other in the classroom. My wondering would be what question uh, do you, would, would you want to uh, see students uh, or you, do you think you should be asking in the classroom? So I write about math uh, at sarahvandorf.com. Uh, I'd love to interact with you um, around social media, uh, particularly in Twitter. So join me there if you have something to say on this.
Until later, friends. Bye.